A new world based on community and collaboration is closer than you think. We can steward resources together. In fact, millions of people are doing just that and not in the history books. This week, David Bollier, author, activist, co-founder of the Commons Strategy Group, explains what it means to think like a commoner. And two activists engaged in Commons projects right now talk about two very distinct but complementary strategies, one digital in Barcelona, the other rural in Mozambique. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Today we heard from David Bollier, who's with um, the Schumacher Institute and he was talking about the commons. It was a really fascinating conversation about um, the way that we understand markets and people's relationship to um, economic transactions. And Bollier made a whole bunch of different points, but I think one of the most important is talking about the very strange way in which modern economists think about economic transactions, like I buy this from you, as devoid of uh, connection, humanity, um, uh, somebody brought up spirituality, that in fact, market transactions have always also engaged us as whole people. You know, in a lot of ways, what he's talking about is, is returning to a time where we actually, you know, uh, as, a, as a public, had control over our own spaces and our land and everything wasn't about commodification by the market or in this case also by the government. Maybe what's actually most inspiring is the feeling of than thinking of my own city, Kingston, and how, how much we're touching on all this. We're not, you, we haven't really thought about that word yet. We maybe haven't figured out the, uh, the economic structure, but we're, we're tapping into the things about land use, about our, how we use food and food access, um, even just little things with uh, how we exchange, right? Uh, and how we exchange services, like we're, we're tapping into all these things that are very much relevant. This area, Hudson Valley, I think is very much relevant for this discussion. So David, thanks for joining us. It's great to have you with us. Great to be here. The first time I said the word commons, that I was going to be talking to you about the commons, uh, a friend of mine said, isn't that old, ancient history. You've heard that before. I've heard it all the time. Uh, people think it's either associated with a, a strip mall, the such and such commons, or English history. In fact, it's a very contemporary phenomenon, and I would even go further, it's part of human history. We've always been cooperators. It's uh, what we're hardwired to do. The whole idea of homo economicus, that we're utility maximizing, selfish, uh, materialistic creatures, is an aberration in history. And uh, what, what's happening is I think we're rediscovering a lot of these mm. roots of humanity, uh, partly through the internet, which has encouraged and facilitated sharing and collaboration and shown how artificial property rights are. Uh, so it's opening up a new exploration of both the economy as well as our inner lives. So, but what about the tragedy of the commons? I mean, if you went, to, if you went through, an, through an economics course any time in the last 40 years, you would have heard about the tragedy of the commons. Well, this is kind of a, both a fable and a smear of collective action by a famous biologist of the late 60s, Garrett Hardin, who wrote an essay by that title, The Tragedy of the Commons. And he said, imagine you have a pasture where you can put any number of cattle or sheep on, it will result in the overgrazing and ruination of the uh, commons, and it'll be a tragedy. Uh, Really what he was describing was more akin to the tragedy of the market, where there's no community, no rules, no punishment for violators. Uh, a commons is a managed system where a social community gets together and says, we're going to manage this resource uh, sustainably for the future. And in fact, empirically, uh, that happens all around the world throughout history. We've had Peter Leinbaugh on the show, the historian of the commons, and he talks about commoning as a verb. In fact, he says you can't have commons without commoning, that it's an active engagement of people. Well, this is one reason why economists like to ignore it, because how do you put uh, activities and practices into a spreadsheet? Uh, they like precise quantitative mathematical models and predictions. They don't like to acknowledge that the economy is socially embedded, that we actually have a role in co-creating the economy. And the commons is about uh, giving a 
vehicle and mechanisms and governance for managing our own economy, not to meet maximum profit or financial speculation, but to meet, meet everyday needs. Mm. And that too is not is somewhat seen as beneath the uh, grand aspirations of economics. So you talk about self provisioning. Um, is that, how is that different from subsistence, or is it? Well, subsistence is often portrayed by the mainstream as bare survival or scraping by or extreme poverty. What it really means is meeting needs for households, which is the original notion of economics in the Greek, oikos, the household, as opposed to these derivative versions of corporations or international finance. Let's talk about meeting the needs of households. Yeah. And so the commons is focused on that which is a very different kettle of fish than what most economists like to think and, and talk about. But today, when the markets are not meeting basic needs and there's abject poverty, precariousness, and so on, that's what we should be talking about. And by mutualizing resource use, we're able to cut costs and to allow greater participation as well as, interestingly, more responsibility. So it's not just entitlements, give me, give me. It's like people can step up and play a role in stewarding the resources they depend upon. So give us some examples. Well, the classic ones are natural resource commons, such as farmland or fisheries or irrigation water, uh, forests, uh, wild game, Rivers. in which people manage those resources collectively. You know, indigenous people, traditional communities, it's standard. Uh, in, but in the Western world, they rarely, uh, they rarely talk about that so much. However, even in our advanced Western world, we have lots of digital commons that are quite familiar to people. Uh, Linux and open source software, Wikipedia, open access publications. Uh, there's, in fact, it's the default mode of do doing things online is sharing because you don't need a huge infrastructure or marketing budget or lawyers. You do it. And I think sharing, as many authors such as Jeremy Rifkin have pointed out, is really uh, the default mode of getting things done and it's beating the pants off of many markets. So what are we up against? I mean, if you go back to the period that Peter Leinbaugh writes about, enclosures were a sort of post-medieval phenomenon entering in, you know, issuing in the era of of capitalism, basically, and privatization. Enclosure today, does it look the same way? Well, enclosure today uh, takes the same basic dynamics in that it tries to privatize and commodify, for market purposes, our shared wealth. Now, it was a huge social cataclysm when that occurred in English history, where shared pastures and forests and game and so forth were privatized. It forced the world that Charles Dickens chronicled of pauperism, uh, wage slavery and so forth of the Industrial Revolution. We're having more or less the same phenomena now where everything from the human genome to words are being privatized. Uh, and this is a massive enclosure that is barely acknowledged by mainstream politics because basically the markets, I call it the market, the state and the market are so allied that they've become the market state. And they both help to enclose, meaning to privatize and to dispossess people of their shared wealth. So markets out of control, financialization out of control, and not meeting human needs. What brought you to the commons? Partly all of these phenomena which have been occurring over the past 30 or 40 years, and partly also a realization that mainstream political life, especially the two parties, including the Democrats, are not addressing these issues yeah. and are not likely to. And so I uh, s fell in with a number of activists and other refugees from Washington politics who saw the commons as a new way to develop, a, a, you might call it a sovereign discourse for expressing values that conventional politics is declining to get involved with. Because you had been a protege of Ralph Nader. You'd been a citizen activist, a citizen lobbyist for good nonprofits. And I still have great admiration for the work that Ralph has done and my life in the 70s and 80s was essentially fighting enclosures of the commons. We didn't even have a vocabulary for that in the time. It was fighting the privatization of public lands and the public airwaves and federal R&D. Uh, that was part of the problem. We don't have the vocabulary to name and reclaim mm. the resources that belong to us or, let's take it even further, create new governance and provisioning structures 
to capture the value that we create. Why should we be digital serfs on the Google or Twitter plantation? Why shouldn't we capture that ourselves? There's a movement called platform cooperativism that's attempting to mutualize the benefits as well as the responsibilities of managing our own platforms instead of having Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalists own that. Is there a role for government in this commoning that you're describing? And yes. So what is First it? of all, government, government needs to decriminalize commoning. It, why should it be illegal to share seeds? Uh, why should it be illegal to share code or other things like that? That's a human propensity. Uh, that creates value more than uh, some mega corporation owning it all for itself. Two, we need to authorize legally uh, some of these commons to create and authorize new type of organizational forms to be legal. And we need to recognize that the common sector is not just a thousand points of light or civil society. It's a generative value creating sector of the economy that even the market and government depend upon. So let's start protecting it and treating it as a valuable resource. But do we need government to take the lead to create commons or to start no. practicing uh, commoning? The, the state, the government, is likely to assert its own interests, especially in its alliances with markets and investors and the affluent. So I think that commoners need to create this as a semi-autonomous realm, the way the, the uh, originators of Linux did, mm -hmm. the way the originators of the local food movement did. They didn't say, please, Washington, can I do this? Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the beauty of the commons. We don't need permission to do this. We can do it now. It's a matter of self-organizing. And if the law says you can't do it, that's when you mm. get engaged with politics to, to fight back. Well, so talk a bit about the, the challenges here. I mean, one of the things you've identified is that people think there's no governance, but there actually is governance and self-governance in a commons. When something goes wrong, when someone oversteps or doesn't do their part or tries to take up more space than they're, they're entitled to, what happens? How do, you, how do you govern a commons? Well, if you've ever been to a dinner party, you know that social norms can be quite powerful and that uh, they, they operate often on very large scales. Wikipedia, which consists of many different languages, has more than 100,000 participants as editors or contributors. And yet they've devised a governance structure, not always perfect, not a magic bullet, but a, a very mm -hmm. functional system. And we've seen the same with dozens of open source software communities. And there's a lot of frontier innovation going on there, as well as many of the historic models from history in natural resources. Can commoning help us unravel white supremacy and patriarchy, some of the systemic biases in it, our current economy? The commons gives us a space for having these conversations in a fresh way. We don't have to be hostage to some of the old history, which is not to say we ignore that history, but it gives us open spaces for inaugurating some new conversations. And to the extent that uh, disadvantaged communities, minorities, and women have been disproportionately dependent upon commons, non-market worlds, reviving those commons will tend to help them. Mm. And well, not only in terms of meeting economic needs, but in terms of social inclusion, connection, participation. Sylvia Frederici wrote about the burning of witches as really being a prosecution of people who were commoning. Well, women, when after the enclosures in England, women who persisted in using the commons were often vilified and burned because they were violating the, the new regime of enclosure. And women, really, as, as uh, uh, Peter Leinbaugh, the historian, points out, Women are the taproot of the commons historically because they've been meeting household needs through the commons. So we're going to keep trying to taproot here. Um, last question. You've written and spoken beautifully about how thinking about the commons gets us out of some familiar and painful and frankly dangerous binaries. Um, talk about that a little bit and how it's changed, this work has changed perhaps your attitude to the your understanding of the relationship of the individual to the society and all of our relationship to value. Well, conventional politics and market transactions regard the public and the private as entirely separate. And we deal in an impersonal way with the public realm. But once we start to realize that, uh, as in the commons, things are relational and not simply transactional, mm -hmm. 
we start to say, you know what, our inner landscape matters as well too. Because if we're talking about relationships, our inner landscape matters. So let's not just talk about white papers and policy and, and law decisions, important as those are. Let's talk about how our culture and social practices and relationships and attitudes towards each other need to be part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. And from that, we can start to originate other types of law instead of simply thinking with our heads and not as much with our hearts. You had a beautiful term, nested eye. Well, people sometimes think that the eye, the, the self and the collective are different and at odds with each other. But I like to think that the, we have a nested eye. My eye is nested within larger collectives, which influence me, which make me. And I'm not a self-made person. Uh, yes, I have certain identity and individualism, but I'm made by my community as well. And it's sort of like the idea of Ubuntu, which is a version of, of Linux. Uh, I am because we are. And I think that's what the nested eye is all about. Very much part of the legacy of Eleanor Ostrom. She, Eleanor Ostrom was the great scholar of the commons who died in 2012. She won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for her pioneering empirical work on the commons as well as her creative theorizing about what makes commons work successfully. And was a big sharer of credit, I think. Eleanor Ostrom was a very generous woman in giving uh, credit to her colleagues and in growing this international network of scholars. And this really helped uh, enormously at a time when as a woman in uh, a male-dominated economics profession, uh, this really wasn't mm. as done as much. So what's next for you? You've been writing about practical commoning. You've written about think like a commoner. Uh, where is this conversation now? And where do you imagine it's going? Things are exploding in Europe where they don't have many of the same bugaboos as we do in the U.S. Intellectually and politically, there are some very interesting phenomena from mainstream political candidates to festivals of the commons to uh, francophone networks of commoners to a pan-European European commons assembly. However, for me, the next frontier is the United States, especially post-Trump, where we need some paradigm-shifting thinking and not just you know, within the conventional structures. We need new structures. We need, and we need to think about how our individual behaviors, our inner landscape needs to manifest itself in these structures so they feel like home. Mm -hmm. uh, because tell me, who feels at home in our current political structures? Uh, and I think that this will be an interesting blending of the networked world and some of the conventional constitutional structures we have, but we need to change. David Bollier, thank you so much. That was great talking with you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. As David Bollier said, billions of people around the world are right now thinking like commoners. I had a chance to talk with two of them this spring when I attended a meeting convened by the Transnational Institute and the Alternative Information and Development Center based in Cape Town, South Africa. Grasa Samu is the director of the Global March of Women, and Mayo Fuster is on the faculty of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and a researcher at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Most of the women that I engage with, they are involved in agriculture and they organize their lives from the, you know, the, their relationship with nature, their pos the possibility of them to produce the food they have, they want to eat, and to produce uh, the other means of living which they need. Uh, so the debate that we are having here in common, it relates a lot with, with, uh, with my background, where I come from, because it actually, we live in a reality where we don't uh, have the state to take care of ourselves. We don't have the state institutions to deliver what we want, what we need. And it's the people, it's the women particularly, who organize the community life. I discovered the comments through the internet and how far uh, through the new technologies we can uh, collaborate in order to create uh, knowledge commons that uh, democratize the access to knowledge. 
But then I, jump, I jump into the urban commons because I think the technology is also uh, shaping the conditions of possibility of both the enclosement of the commons or actually the rising of the commons in the, uh, at the city level. When we talk about production is that, okay, I can produce what I need, but it's not enough because I don't, even if I say that I can produce vegetables, I can produce cassava, I can produce potatoes, there are things which I may not produce. So there are other women who will be producing other things. Women do it in rural areas in a communal way. It's not that they buy the labor of each other, but they support each other. Because while they worked this week in this land, and next week they can be working in somebody else's land. But it's an exchange. The natural commons and the, let's say, digital commons. For me, the core elements of both cases, or any typology of uh, uh, commons, is on the one hand, there are, as um, uh, Grasa has said, uh, on the one hand, there is a community of people self-organized mm -hmm. in order to uh, uh, collaboratively produce a resource. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they govern the process and they collectively own the process. This is the first characteristic that is based on uh, principle of the commons. It's very much important to look at what, what do we understand as development. I think everything starts from there because uh, we fail uh, to think what can be common because we fail to define development on the right way. We use a concept of development which is a Western concept, which is designed in thinking what is the standard that the world wants, not really what relates to the people who are involved in the process. Somehow it assumes that there are some uh, countries that are underdeveloped and that they need to reproduce a center mo model of development in order to, to develop. And the commons actually bring a, a totally different picture because the commons, uh, uh, who actually were a pre-capitalistic form, are much more developed in the uh, uh, south, global south. So there is a lot of elements in which we can bring and, and learn from the so-called underdevelopment countries. And this is a, 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 a channel in order to actually uh, uh, recover and, uh, and uh, survive in the <laughs> development world. The commons provide a way in which to create uh, interconnections between three main problems in the current development system. The first one is the, 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 the ex excessive uh, productiveness and exploitation of, uh, of uh, people conditions, and so a more collaborative and, and, and more human uh, uh, relations around creating and working together. The second one is has to do with putting um, uh, life and environmental in the center, a, a model much more environmentally mm -hmm. uh, friendly and, and recognition of uh, nature. And also putting life in the center, uh, referring to putting the, the needs of people in the center, not the profit. Uh, and in this way, we would uh, solve the, the social dimension, the environmental dimension, and the uh, uh, gender and exclusion diversity a dimension through uh, the framework of the commons is what is a key that interconnect the three of them. Even when we talk about the cities or for instance the, the rural areas or the villages, even in that same context we still have inequalities and we need to acknowledge these inequalities. If you live in the city, it doesn't mean that you are living all in the same standards. You are living and benefiting from a life of commonalities. We are living uh, different levels, different standards, lots of uh, uh, exploitation. And in this, I want always to highlight the fact that there is too much invisibility of women's contribution, women's participation, and women's care work which is very important to bring into the center of all the debate. And this relates to the nature, relates to, the, to, to these commons as, as a whole. Well.